Okay, everybody, we're about to get started. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully everybody can hear. Uh, it doesn't go exactly as planned, but yes, it is. Uh, we're also streaming this live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, so hopefully that's going smoothly as well. Okay, for those of you that are not aware, my name is Carly Garner. I am a futures and options broker in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, sorry, it seems like the, the slide is a little bit slow to, to catch up. Uh, please be mindful of this webinar platform does allow people to unmute themselves, and so we can hear background noise. If you, if you do happen to unmute your mic, everybody can hear it. Uh, anyway, so here we go. Uh, my name is Carly Garner. I work for DeCarly Trading in Las Vegas, Nevada. We are a futures and options brokerage service. If you have any questions or concerns or comments about today's presentation, you can contact me by phone or email. There's my information. You can also visit our website, thecarlytrading.com. You can sign up for free newsletters. You'll find educational videos and articles and that sort of thing. We're really big on informing potential clients on the risks and rewards of trading before they actually get involved because this is um, quite honest, risky business. If you're on social media, you can catch us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. If you just search Carly Garner or DeCarly Trading, they should pop up, but here are our official uh, handles. If you are not a fan of dogs, um, you might be aware that we do, do po post quite a few dog pictures. So um, that's something about Bo and one of the attendees asked why I'm talking about dog pictures and not showing dog pictures. So here's one. Uh, this is Frankie, by the way. So I am a broker, a strategist, an author. I wear quite a few hats, honestly. I'm also a web developer and just about anything else you can think of. As, as a small business owner, that's how it goes. I write articles for uh, monthly columns for Stocks and Commodities magazine. It's called Futures for You if you're interested. Um, I also contribute content to Jim Cramer. of newsletters for our brokerage clients that are exclusive to our bro brokerage clients, the Financial Futures Report, the DeCarly Perspective. As I mentioned before, you can sign up for free trials of these on our newsletter. I mean, I'm sorry, on our website if you're interested. You can also sign up for a free trial of our DeCarly Trading mobile app. The trial gives you access to great information, news feeds, video feeds, all that sort of stuff, anything you, you could ever imagine uh, needing if you want to trade commodities. So I've written a couple of these more than once as multiple editions. Um, but I want, what I want you to focus on, if you are interested in learning more, focus on the two on the, on the top, higher probability commodity trading and a trader's first book on commodities. Uh, the two little books at the bottom exist and you'll find them on, in the second market. They're no longer being published. So I don't recommend that you, you spring for those. They're, they tend to be expensive because they're rare, because they're out of print. Um, I will be rewriting commodity options hopefully this year, so that's the goal. But anyway, if you want to learn about trading commodities, the Trader's First Book on Commodities is a great primer, in my opinion, of course. I wrote it, so I'm biased. But it will give you all the information you need to know before you trade, and higher probability commodity trading will give you information on uh, basically what you need to know while you're trading or putting together your trading strategy. So before we get started, I want to make sure everyone understands there's a substantial amount of risk in trading futures and options. It's not for everybody. It, it's not any easy money. It's speculation, and it can be difficult. We're trying to beat the markets, and that's not easy to do. So let's get started in what we're all here to talk about, which is option spreads. This class is a little bit tricky because I want to talk about option strategies, but I also want to talk about placing the order in an in a order entry platform, specifically the Zener 360. 
but a lot of the things that we're going to talk about apply to uh, just about any option platform that has option capabilities. That said, uh, it, I found that as I started going through and writing the material, I found that it's a lot of information, and so um, this is probably probably should have been two classes, not one. But we'll start with one, and then we'll see how it goes. Maybe we'll add another one for next month or um, somewhere down the line. So anyway, options are an incredibly versatile tool. They provide traders with quote unquote options, pardon the pun. The idea is you use a combination of long and short calls and puts to create various levels of risk, reward, and leverage. Now some of you that have been to some of our previous classes might be thinking to yourself, can't that be um, various long and short futures as well as calls and puts? And then the answer is yes, but for today we're just going to focus strictly on options. And the reason being, there aren't any platforms out there that allow you to trade futures and options on the same takes efficient way to do it. But with that said, we're going to talk about option spreads. So what is an option spread? A spread is a combination of long and short options that together work towards a common goal. By the way, I'm going to dive right, right into option spreads because like I said, this class ended up being a little lengthy and I know nobody wants to be here for two hours. We all have lives outside of trading. So I am kind of assuming that everybody knows what calls and puts are. If you don't, visit decarlytrading.com. We have all kinds of free videos and articles that will teach you the the super basic stuff. But assuming we all know what calls and puts are and long and short options, let's proceed. Option buyers purchase a primary long option and then they surround it by short options to finance the trade. The primary long option determines whether you're bullish or bearish. So if you buy a call option, obviously you're bullish. If you buy a put option, obviously you're bearish. bearish. But with an option spread, you're not just purchasing those options and hoping for the best, you're purchasing those options and then you're selling either calls or puts or maybe even both around it to help finance your trade because options are eroding assets and options are expensive. So if you're just going around buying options, the chances are you're going to slowly watch your option value erode and you're going to lose money. As a spread trader, you're putting time value at least somewhat in your, on your side. So as options erode, if you're long an option and you're short an option, you're, t you're taking advantage of the time value erosion while you're waiting for your, the option that you purchased to pay off. So if you're an option seller, you're on the opposite end of that coin. A premium collector or an option seller sells a primary option and then purchases a, ch purchases a cheaper option for insurance. The primary short option determines whether you're bullish or bearish. So if you sell a put, you're bullish. If you sell a call, you're bearish. Any options that you buy around that primary option is, is simply a hedge. And this is what a spread trading is. I know there's all these kind of fancy terms for spreads like iron condors and ratio spreads and all these sorts of things, but really all they are are just a way to either buy an option to place a directional speculation while selling options around it to pay for that option that you want to buy. As an option seller, it's the opposite. Again, you're taking a primary speculation by selling a call or a put, but rather than accepting unlimited risk, you're purchasing some sort of option to um, counteract that. So as a result, as an option spread is inherently hedged in most scenarios. There are a few outliers in which people got creative and, and created spreads that um, honestly aren't hedged at all, they're just doubling up. But that's another, that's another class. So in a traditional option spread, the position's hedged. As the market goes up, some legs of the spread are making money and some are losing and vice versa. And that's just exactly how it works. Uh, I talk to traders and clients all the time and they get frustrated at the idea that they put out an option spread, they were right in the direction of the market, the option that they wanted to make money made money, but the options that they traded around it to hedge, you know, as part of their spread, lost so much money that it engulfed a big chunk of their 
of their profits. So in other words, they were disappointed that they were right, but their spread only made a little bit of money instead of making a lot of money, which would have been the case had they traded the option outright rather than done it as a spread. But the reality is most trades probably aren't going to go your way. And if, you know, so if they do, that's great. But if they don't, you want to make sure you have a hedge. At least this is my opinion. If you found some sort of strategy or edge that allows you to pick the direction of the market with almost certainty, then by all means, don't hedge. You don't need to. Don't trade spreads. Just trade outright, maybe even outright futures. But if you're like me and you're not perfect, spreads are a good way to go because it reduces your uh, need to be perfect, gives you room for error. So spread traders are enjoying the best of both worlds. Spread trading enables a reduction of market volatility relative to the outright futures trading. Anybody that's traded futures, especially in markets like crude oil or gold, know that you can make or lose an incredible amount of money in a very short period of time, which is awesome if you're on the right side of the trade, but if you're on the wrong side of the trade, it's devastating. So as an option spread trader, you're basically reducing that volatility. You're um, shrinking your P&L, which again, if you're profitable, you might be a little uh, disheartened by the fact that you shrunk your P&L because you hedged. But more often than not, you're going to be happy that you did because your timing probably wasn't perfect. And the great thing about option spreads is you can be as aggressive or conservative as you want. You can adjust the vary of aggression based on the strike prices you choose, the months you choose. For some people, this is really overwhelming. Some people have a hard time narrowing down which expiration to use, which um, strike prices to use. And to be honest, there's no right or wrong way. It's extremely ambiguous. It, the goal is to put on conservative or your risk tolerance or the time horizon of your specific trading signal or whatever it is. So again, the idea of an option spread is long option traders or long option spread traders reduce their cost and arguably their risk through the sale of options around their primary long call or long put. Premium collectors who are spread traders can cap their maximum risk to protect runaway losses. So if you're an option seller, the idea is rather than selling an option naked, you could do it as a spread and have limited risk. If you would have talked to me about two or three years ago, I probably would have, in fact I know, I would have leaned toward selling options naked. But things are, have changed, the environment has changed. Uh, in today's market with algos and things like that pushing prices around maybe a little further than, than what we might have seen in the past, I really do believe that any short option should have some sort of catastrophic insurance in place. You, want, you don't want that one bad trade to wipe out years of hard work. Anybody that's followed option selling in general is probably aware of the hedge fund or the CTA more specifically that was blown out in late 2018. There, uh, the particular portfolio manager had quite a few short calls in natural gas and short puts in crude oil at strike prices that probably um, were relatively reasonable as far as being out of the money. But as they found out, sometimes when volatility spikes and you don't have any insurance in place or any type of hedge, things having some sort of spread in place to prevent that sort of tail risk from completely wiping out an account is imperative. So why do option buyers spread trade? The primary reason is to use the market's money to buy the options, not your own. Options are so expensive and most of them expire worthless. So if you're spending a ton of money to buy options, you're probably in the end not going to do well in your trading account unless again you, you are better than I am in timing. If your timing is perfect, Maybe option buying is the way to go. But for case, if you buy an option, you probably want to sell at least one, maybe even two options to finance the trade. You want to bring premium in to pay for that option that you're buying. And this is basically uh, of the dismal odds that are facing long options. If most options expire worthless and you're always buying them, you're going to have a hard time in the long run making money. 
So why do option sellers spread trade? And the reason we, is, we've already kind of touched on this, is to limit risk, reduce stress, and lower margin. There are actually arguments against spread trading, and I've made those arguments in the past. Like I said, I've kind of changed my thinking um, from, unfortunately, some tough lessons in the markets and just observations and things like that. We really encourage you to always have catastrophic insurance in place. And that doesn't mean you have to buy expensive insurance. If you're selling an option for $500, you could probably get away with buying some sort of insurance policy for 100 bucks or less that it's not going to help you if the market goes moderately against you. But if the market explodes and volatility explodes in the, in, against you in the wrong direction, at least you're only on the hook for a limited amount of money. There is some sort of floor in place. And I have found also that uh, just, again, observations and talking to people and, and um, testing things out on my own, I have found that having that insurance in place does absolute wonders for reducing stress. Uh, I find better of sounder you know, mind and body. Okay, so let's talk about specifically trading spreads within the Zaner 360. Now, some of you might be wondering, what is the Zaner 360? I keep talking about this. It is simply an order entry platform that, uh, quite honestly, the majority of our clients do use. We have clients using other platforms. In fact, we offer probably, if you really wanted to count, probably somewhere around 30 platforms, maybe a few more, maybe a few less, but in that ballpark, uh, but almost all of our clients use the Zener 360. It's a, an order entry platform. It's not something you're going to use to analyze um, the markets or analyze, you know, run option analytics. By the way, I'm not a big fan of option analytics. I know some people are. They want to see what their margin calculator tells them this option will be worth 10 days from now if the futures market goes to here or here. And I got to admit, those types of things are fun, but I will honestly tell you they're probably... Uh, more misleading than anything else because they give people a, sol a false sense of comfort. I've seen option calculators say, you know, tell me an option has a 2% chance of expiring in the money, meaning if you sell it, you have a 98% chance of making money. And then three days later, that option is um, causing a huge drawdown in a trading account. Those things happen all the time. And the reason being the option calculators that option analytics software use they're using yesterday's parameters or maybe even maybe even today's, but let's assume it's today's. It's a snapshot of the Greeks, a snapshot of the volatility, uh, implied volatility. I'm talking about the, the delta, the gamma, all those sorts of things. They're just snapshots, but they can change tomorrow. They can change in five minutes, and it will give you a completely different scenario. So I'm really not a fan of those. Um, that said, if you do want that sort of thing, we have platforms you can upgrade to to access those, but I, I'm not sure it's worth the money. That said, uh, Zaner 360 is a free platform. It has option chains. It has point and click order entry. You can trade futures from the chart. For a free platform, it's pretty nice. And it now, recently, uh, within the last year or so, has added option spreads, which has been a very nice addition. Not all options or option spreads should actually be entered as spreads, and I'll, we'll talk about that later. There is, you can leg into option spreads. There's nothing wrong with that, and in some cases it actually makes sense. Again, we'll talk about that later, but for now let's talk about um, entering option spreads into a trading platform, specifically the Zener 360. So the idea of entering an option spread is a, on a single ticket is it allows you to buy or sell combinations of options with a single order. And the great thing about that is you're not at risk of being filled on one leg while the other moves adversely, which causes price slippage on your fill. So for example, if you want to sell an option strangle, which involves the sell of a put, sale of a put and the sale of a call, you can do it on one single ticket. You can name the price that you want for that particular package and work the order scenario, you're either filled on both or you're not filled on both. There's no one or the other. So it's important to always keep in mind in the Zener 360, and honestly in, in most platforms, not all, but in most, option spreads are quoted from the buyer's perspective. 
for those of you that are, have just gotten into trading in the electronic era, this seems a little bit crazy, but actually this is how it's been done for years and years and years. It, back in the days when I used to call the trading pits or you know the, the floors, the CME or NYMEX or whatever floor I was calling, if I wanted to know the quote of an option strangle or a bull call spread or, or something like that, I didn't ask for, you know, what's the, I didn't give them two different scenarios. I gave them one title of one spread and they gave me a bidder and ask. And that bidder ask is what you can buy the trade at and what you can sell it at. So for example, let's look at a vertical spread. If we're talking about a vertical spread using a March $60 call in oil and a March 63 call in oil. If you're the buyer of that spread, you might you might have heard this referred to as a bull call spread. You're buying the 60 and you're selling the 63. The seller of the spread, who is trading what's called a, a bear call spread, would sell the $60 call and buy the 63, but it's the exact same spread. There's no need for the exchange to list that spread two ways. If they listed it in the opposite way, selling the 60 and buying the 63, there's a typo in the slide, by the way. I apologize. I just noticed it. It would it would be basically create two spreads for the exact same strategy, so it would spread liquidity out. Um, it would create wider bid ask than necessary and more confusion, and it honestly would be a strain on the servers for both trading platforms and the exchange. There's really just no way, reason to do it that way. Just like in the old days when we called the floor. If we wanted a quote on the 60-63 call spread, they would give us the bid ask. We didn't have to specify whether we were buying it or selling it. Once we got the bid ask spread, we would then decide, are we buying it or selling it? So remember, when you're quoting spreads, and this is true even outside of trading platforms, if you're talking to people in the industry, they're always going to kind of expect you to know the same format. You're always going to list the call first, if it's a spread that has calls and puts, and you're always going to list the most expensive is the option that has a closer to the money strike price is the one that you're going to list first. So again, just to make sure you understand, when we're talking about vertical spreads, a vertical spread is the 60-63 call spread, whether you're buying it or selling it. You're, there's no need to create just different uh, objectives. So I'm not going to go through each and every one of these. If you're if you're using the Zeta 360 platform, you will find that the definition of each type of spread is actually sitting there for you to view as you're entering an order. But this is kind of how the exchange defines each and every position. And you notice on the last slide I, I did mention that the exchange always lists the call first. You can see the calls first on that. Um, the closer to the money strike price is always going to be first. And you always generally are always going to list uh, the buy first as opposed to the sell. But it, it's complicated and the good news is you don't have to remember everything. The platform will remind you as you go. So this is what it might look like if you are going to place an order in the Zaner 360 platform. This is just a standard order entry window. Um, you notice here it says standard futures order entry. Some people get confused by this because it says futures. And if you notice the asset here is also listed as futures. That's going to be the case whether you're trading futures or options on futures. This platform uh, in the past was used to trade Forex as well. And so having the asset toggled to futures just means you're trading futures or options on futures and not Forex. So you will ch make sure this is set to at, uh, futures as the asset. It does it by default. You shouldn't have to change it, but I just don't want any confusion over that. The type by default is standard, and with a standard order entry, you can just enter a regular future or an option in this window here. But if you want to enter a spread, you click on the standard, a drop-down menu will appear. By the way, I'm doing this in slides because the markets are closed this time of day, or at least getting ready to close. And I didn't want to try to uh, show you these things in a platform with the market closed. I think it would just cause more confusion. So toggle from standard, and then a menu will pop up.
once you choose the type of spread that you're going to trade, the platform will show you the rules. So you, again, you don't have to remember them, but you notice this is the format, and so there, now you know that's how you enter the trade. Because all strategies are from a buyer's perspective, in almost all of the spreads that, were, that are built into the platform, you'll notice that it'll choose bear or bull for you. You don't really get to choose that. There's one exception to that, and that's the ratio spread, and we will talk about that. But if you choose a put vertical, it's assuming you're the buyer. You don't have to be, but it's assuming that. So it's a bear spread. It gives you the rules. It'll um, give you the format, buy one and sell one. As a, on a side note, there is an execution time in this platform, so if you don't want your order to be submitted to the exchange right away, let's say that it's towards the end of the trading day and you want your order to be working tomorrow on the open or later in the evening when the night session opens, you can choose an execution time and release time and the platform will cert Okay, so the great thing about the Zaner 360 is that it has access to any option the exchange lists, and that includes weekly options, Monday, Wednesday, Friday options, uh, and the currencies, they actually have options that expire in the morning and also expire at night, so that's great. The downside of that is it can get a little overwhelming, especially for new traders that aren't familiar with symbols or uh, just the sheer number of options that are listed, so it can be a little confusing. The one way to find the symbol that you're trading is to, on the order entry screen, there's a little magnifying glass, and let me go back to that screen actually, so I can show you. You'll notice there's a little magnifying glass right here. If you click on that magnifying glass, it is going to bring you to a, a search area. And in that search area, you can find the symbol you're looking for. There's also an easier way to do it, and I will show you that in a minute. You can pull the search, I'm sorry, you can pull the symbol directly from a quote board or from an option chain by just clicking on it. So you don't have to use this search box, but I'm going to show you how to do it anyway. So if you click the magnifying glass, you can just start typing in crude oil or corn or whatever it is that you want to trade, and things will start to populate. Make sure that you highlight options because if you don't, it's going to populate future symbols and future spreads and all kinds of crazy stuff. So make sure options is highlighted and then you can start typing and it will, it will give you some, some solutions. That said, you'll find that once you get familiar with the way that these symbols are arranged, I think you'll find it much easier to actually type in the symbol yourself. So you'll notice um, the format here and we'll talk about So let's talk about how a vertical spread might be placed. Uh, well, actually, first let's talk about what a vertical spread would look like, the setup, the chart work, all that sort of stuff. So let's assume that you're a soybean trader and you think soybeans are probably going higher, or it, if they're not going higher, they're probably at least going to stay above the 860 mark, which is down here. You could take a position by selling an 860 put, you could do it naked, and you'd bring in about $0.11, cent, which, which is roughly $575. Or you could do that and also purchase some sort of insurance policy by purchasing the, the $8 put for $0.3.5. Cents. In essence, this is a vertical spread. You're selling it, but what you're really doing is you're selling an 860 put and you're buying an $8 put for insurance just in case you're dead wrong. You'll notice in this particular example, this trader makes money if the market goes up, down, or sideways. The only way for this trader to lose money is if the market's below 860, which is down here. Below 860, uh, actually, I take it back. Because you're collecting a, a little bit of a premium on the spread, the market can actually go a little below 860, um, closer to, we'll just call it 852 or so. So you, as long as the market stays above 852, you make some money. You can see the, the wide range in error you have. You don't have to be right. Soybeans don't have to go up. They just can't go down too far. They just can't go below here. And if they do, you have a risk cap in place. If things get ugly, 
you're going to lose, and it might, you might lose. So, and they say insurance is expensive, and it is, just like car insurance, house insurance, anything else in life, but the reality is, when you do finally need it, it's going to be well worth it, and you'll real and it'll, you'll be reminded of why you've been buying insurance all along. Might be one or two years down the road, but eventually you will need it. So one trick thing, what one trick or not trick, but one thing to know about the Zaner 360 is that all option symbols start with an O. So if you're feeling bold and you don't want to use the magnifying glass and you want to just start typing in your option symbol, just start with an O, and then b start typing, if it's soybeans, ZS, and we can provide a list for you if you need help. If you want a link to a list of symbols, we can give that to you, it'll make it a little easier. As you start trading, you will learn these, it'll become second nature to you, but um, if you just type in an O, and then start typing in the future symbol that you're probably a little more familiar with, you'll start to see things populate. And obviously, if you're trading a put, it's going to be a P. If you're trading a call, it's going to be a C. Just keep in mind that the P and the C are going to have a space between the option uh, description and the type. So in other words, OZSN19 space P or space C if you're trading a call. And again, you don't have to know the symbols. It makes it a lot easier if you do, but if you don't, you can pull them right from the quote board or the option chain. You just click on, click on them. And so make, while you're entering orders, I just want to remind everyone, make sure you are following the exchange rules. They are always defined for you as you're entering them. If you don't, you'll notice as you're putting in your strategy, the options won't, they won't click, they won't take, and that that's obvious when you don't see a bid or an ask. Sometimes the symbol will turn red. If the, if the platform doesn't recognize it or if it thinks you're doing something wrong, the symbol might turn red and you will not see a bid or an ask. So in this case, we are selling a vertical spread. So we're selling an 860, we're buying an $8 put. This seems a little bit confusing because Remember, this is in the buyer's perspective. And I know it's hard at first, but once you do this a couple times, it'll really honestly just start acting natural, and then you'll realize it's probably that is the best way to do it, and it's the only way to do it. If you start listing two different spreads for, every, for the buyer and the seller, it's just a waste of resources, and it complicates things, and it's going to mess with liquidity as well. It'll drain liquidity. This way we have both the buyer and the seller going to the same symbol and the same strategy, and it makes it for a better marketplace. So remember, this is a put spread, so this should be a P, not a C, and that's why it's not, it's not populating the, uh, the symbols to choose from. This is how the spread will look when it's correctly placed. It's a put vertical. It's a bearer spread because it's the buyer's perspective, but we are sellers. So all we do to take the sell side of this is we choose sell instead of buy. If we clicked buy, then we would be doing trading the spread exactly how it shows above. If we're clicking sell, we're doing the opposite of this. So if we're selling the put spread that's listed above, we're doing the opposite of this. We're, buy we're not buying the 860, we're selling it. We're not selling the $8, we're buying it. Whenever you get a bid ask on an option spread, they're giving you two prices, the bid and the ask. The bid is the price you can sell it at, the ask is the price you would pay if you want to buy. Again, it's the same spread, whether you just choose to buy that spread or sell it, it's the same spread. So don't allow this to confuse you. Just because it's listed in the buyer's perspective up above, allow yourself to sell that spread at whatever price you want. I would recommend choosing a limit order and then toggling the price to some price between this. In almost any scenario I can think of when you're trading options, you want to split the bid and ask on your limit order. So when you're placing a limit order, you don't want to pay, you don't want to sell the bid and you don't want to pay the ask. Those quotes are, are market maker quotes. If you're paying the ask and selling the bid, you're basically just giving the market maker a few extra bucks for no, no apparent reason. Also, you don't ever want to place spread orders or optional orders, 
even outright option orders. You never want to place market orders. You always want to place limit orders. People have a hard time with this. They, it's a lot easier to place a market order. You don't have to be conscious of the price, and that's sort of, it's quicker. But the reality is if you're placing option orders using market orders, it's probably going to get rejected by the exchange. And if it doesn't, if the exchange does accept it, you're basically paying the bid and paying the ask, and it's just unnecessary slippage. So it's, it's ironic to me. A lot of people are so worried about saving a dollar or two in commission, but then they go in and place market orders on options that cost them like sometimes 50, 60, 70 bucks or more in unnecessary slippage just because they didn't realize that placing a limit order would save them $50 versus placing a market order. So they saved a buck in commission and they lost 49 to 50 bucks in slippage. So it makes no sense. Always use limit orders. If you're really in a hurry to get out of the market, you can pay the bid. I'm sorry, you can pay the ask or you can sell the bid, but still use a limit order because if the market moves while you're entering in your ticket, you might end up getting even more slippage than you thought you were getting. So with that said, the quote that you see on this spread order ticket, this is a hypothetical quote. The seven and three quarters and eight and a half is a hypothetical quote. You are not guaranteed an, a fill if you place an order at eight and a half or seven and three quarters because all this platform is doing is taking the bid and the ask from the individual options, which are displayed up here, and netting them and, and telling you what the hypothetical bid and ask spread would be. In reality, for you to get filled, somebody has to be willing to take the other side, and there's no guarantee that someone's willing to take the other side at the prices that the computer has estimated to be fair. More often than not, if you're in liquid markets, you're probably not going to have much of a problem. Splitting the bid ask, for example, in this order we're trying to sell at 8 and 1 eighth, probably going to get filled. The market maker will probably come to it, but you're not guaranteed that. So if you put an order in at the bid or the ask and you don't get filled, don't call your broker and, and ask why. It's because somebody just simply wasn't willing to trade it at that price and you need to adjust your price. If you were trading outright options, that would, be, that would not be the case. I'm only specifically talking about. Something to also keep in mind about spreads is not, uh, not all spreads are listed. Well, actually, I'll talk, I'll talk about that a little later. I apologize. I'm getting ahead of myself. So again, I just want to make sure you understand spreads are quoted from the buyer's perspective. So the rule of thumb is you're buying the spread if you're paying for the spread, if it's a debit. If you're spending more on the option that you're purchasing than you are collecting for the option you're selling, you're buying the spread. If you're receiving a credit, if you're being paid to execute that spread, spread you're selling it. This generally means, and there's some exceptions to this rule, but in most traditional spreads, it generally means if you're buying the spread, you're buying the option that's closer to the money meaning your strike price is closer to the current futures price, and that's generally the more expensive option. If you're selling the spread, you're, use, you're basically selling the option that's closer to the So once all of the symbols are entered into the platform, you'll notice that everything populates. The bid and the ask on each individual option populates because you have it entered correctly. You have the bid and ask on the spread because everything's entered correctly. You can toggle the sell. You can change your order type to limit. Like I said, no market orders. You adjust your price accordingly. And then from there, you're going to hit the transmit button. Do not click new order. If you click new order, it's going to wipe everything out, and you're going to start from a fresh ticket. So new order wipes everything out. Transmit is what sends it. It's a good idea in this platform if you intend to trade the same spread again, you probably want to save it. And this is going to almost always you're going to want to trade uh, sorry almost always you're going to want to trade the same spread again because you're going to have to get out at some point very few people let it go to expiration i don't recommend letting spreads or options that go to ex expiration it's just generally not a good idea that said you're probably going to want to buy your spread back so if you sell it today you may want to buy it back later a week from now two weeks from now maybe two months from now it's it's hard to say but at that point, you can easily buy back your spread if you've saved it. So to save it, once you enter everything in as you'd like, remember we're doing a put vertical, 
We've entered our strike prices. Everything's taken because we have quotes. We have it on the sell side. We have a limit order chosen, and we have our price entered. Now we click Save. Once we do that, it names a template for us. You can rename it if you want. I just use the default because I don't see any point in renaming it. Uh, but if you click Save, it's going to name it for you, or you can type in any name you want, and you hit OK. Once you do that, in the future, if you want to trade the same spread again, you just click on the template button, and you choose it, and it loads everything for you. All you have to do is change the price. And you're probably going to want to change it to buy. So unless you're adding to the trade, then you'd keep it at sell. If you're buying it back, you would switch the side to buy. Once you hit the transmit button, it's not going to automatically just send your trade to be filled. Thank goodness. An order confirmation will pop up. The order confirmation is really key, and you really want to pay attention to it because this is where it tells you as an option seller that you are actually doing what you want to do. Remember in the order entry screen, it was in the buyer's perspective, but we were selling the spread, so maybe we were a little nervous because we weren't absolutely sure it was doing what we wanted it to do, and sure enough, on the order confirmation ticket, it is. We're selling the 860 put, we're buying the $8 put. This is our net credit, which is seven and seven eighths, and we're collecting $393.75 minus transaction cost. So now we know for sure we entered it correctly. It's a credit. We're selling the 860, buying the $8. Once everything's confirmed, we can hit submit. Then, and only then, will it actually submit the order to be filled. If you want, you can click do not show this again. And in the future, you can bypass this ticket. When you hit submit, it just goes directly to be filled. I do not recommend that by any means. You always want to double check your work. Make sure the account number is correct. I have the account number blocked out here, but the account number would show here at the top. All of the details here, your net credit here, submit. Place the trade, you still, even though you confirmed on your order ticket, that's what you wanted to do, I still recommend you go to your order, your active orders window, and you look to make sure that it is in fact working, everything's correctly, you can see the state is working. If it's, a, if it's in red, that means you're selling the spread. If it's in green, that means you're buying the spread. Everything looks fine. If you want to modify the order, you just click on it. Once you click on it, the order entry screen populates to, to this particular ticket and it'll have a, the word modifying on it and you can just toggle your price from there. The order and choose cancel. You right click and cancel. Now let's talk about ratio spreads. To use the market's money, we've already dis discussed the fact that options are really expensive. So ratio spreads are a way of buying an option that's relatively close to the money without paying for it. The idea is you're buying an option and selling two or maybe more options to pay for that. My personal opinion is you really don't want to sell more than two options per long option you buy, um, but that's a personal choice. Some people do one by threes, they buy an option, they sell three against it, so on and so forth. It's, it's a risk tolerance thing. Even with a ratio spread, I, and we're not going to really talk about that in this particular example, but I still recommend purchasing insurance. So if you buy a call and sell two calls above the market, it's probably a good idea to sell, or I'm sorry, to buy an extra call above your two shorts for cheaply. I'm not saying spend a fortune on it and cut into your profit potential and all that sort of stuff, but just have some sort of risk cap in case something goes crazy because every once in a while markets do that. Assuming that more options than not expire worthless, the odds of success are better for a spread trader, one that's selling two options for every option they're purchasing, than it is for a trader that's just simply buying options. It might look like this trader is bearish the S&P. He wants to purchase a 2,500 put, but that 2,500 put is 72 points. Anybody that trades the S&P knows that it's $50 a point, so that's $3,600. I think we can all agree that $3,600 to purchase an option that has a good chance of expiring worthless eventually 
is not a good investment. In fact, in this particular case, the market's trading at about 26.30. So for this trader to break even at expiration, the futures price would have to drop by like 200 points just to break even. So it's not such a great deal. Uh, a way to get around that is to sell options to pay for that 2,500 put. So the 2,500 put's expensive, but if you sell two of the uh, 2,300 puts, you basically pay for it. It makes it roughly a free trade. The opportunity cost of doing something like that is you're leaving yourself open to unlimited risk down here. You see, I have the unlimited risk zone. So if the market really, really, really got out of hand, and we're just talking like 2,100-ish, um, you would have unlimited risk below. But I think we can all agree that this is a pretty big profit zone. This is a free trade. You're getting in basically for nothing. If the market keeps going up, you don't lose anything because you, you roughly got in for free. It might cost you a few bucks, depending on uh, transaction costs and those sort of things. But it's essentially free. As long as the market goes up, you're no harm, no foul. If the market goes down, you make money anywhere from 2,500 down to 2,100, you make something. The maximum profit would be roughly $10,000. If, if the futures price was right at 2,300 at expiration, you make 10 grand. So for nothing, you can make possibly 10 grand. It's not so bad, right? It, the, the trick to this is though, if you're right and you're too right, you start getting into trouble and that's the downside. Let's see how this might look in the trading platform. risk and profit zones in on the chart? Uh, the answer to that is no. The chart that I, that I used uh, to display that information, to be quite honest, it's just a plain chart. I manually drew in all those lines, and that's how I do it. I don't use a, a option calculator or anything like that because most of those are hard to read and they're not clear anyway. So I basically just go in and do all the work myself on a chart. Zena 360, you would go to, again, make sure you're set on futures, then choose ratio spread from the drop-down menu. Once you do that, you'll notice it gives you the rules. Although the, the ratio spread's a little bit different than any others. In any others, you can't toggle between calls or puts or bull or bear or anything like that. You, it just is what it is. But in the ratio spread, they do have some uh, aspects of having a user-defined spread, meaning you can choose the quantity of the ratio. You can make it a two by one, a two by three, whatever the case is. So if we did a traditional one by two, which is what this example is, once we enter the two strike prices, the 2,500, we're buying, we're selling, the 2300s, and again, this is in the buyer's perspective. So we're buying the 2500 and selling the 23s. You could sell this spread or you could buy it again. If you sell the spread, you're actually doing the opposite of what we were talking about in the previous slide. You'd be selling the spread would be selling the 2500 and buying the 2300s. Hopefully on the next slide I have uh, the opposite. Let's see. It should actually be buy, not sell. If you're buying the spread that's showing in the platform, you're doing exactly what the exchange rules show. In this case, it really doesn't make much of a difference because we're getting filled at a net price of zero. So we are basically, again, it's a free trade. There is margin on the trade, I wanna clarify that. Just because it's free in regards to premium, like the cash outlay, doesn't mean it's free in regards to margin. There is margin on the trade and you do have to pay commissions, so there are, it's not exactly free, but it's pretty free. The cost of it is really ultimately the opportunity cost of giving up downside risk all the way below the market. So if you're too right, that's where you start getting into trouble. And that's the true risk of this, or the true cost. 
So if you wanted to do a ratio other than the one by two, which is the traditional, you can in this particular version or this particular type of spread and the ratio spread, you can toggle between different ratios. We have, uh, when this platform was originally programmed last year, they just had the original one by two, but we have a lot of clients that trade two by threes um, and other types of ratios and crazy stuff. And so we do a lot of business with the, the vendor, and so they were willing to add this for us. In the future, they're, all, they're adding user-defined spreads for all types of spreads. So in the future, you will be able to basically make up your own crazy, wacky spread and put it in and see if someone will take it. I caution traders, though, that's not always the, the best way to go about it. In fact, more often than not, you're going to run into liquidity issues because, trust me, just because you're willing to build some wild five, six-legged spread doesn't mean that a market maker is willing to mess with it because it takes a lot of time and risk and uh, effort to execute something like that when he can just go out and easily make markets for outright options or for traditional spreads and things like that. So just because you can build some wacky spread doesn't mean someone else wants to fill it for you at a fair price. If you're doing those kinds of spreads, it's fine, but you're probably better off breaking it into traditional spreads that you can find here on the drop-down menu or maybe even just legging into them. Um, depends on the situation. Your broker would be able to help you with that. Low out-of-pocket expense. The margin is existent, but it's pretty cheap. There's a large profit potential. There's a really high probability profit range. We just pointed that out in that S&P trade. You can be within a four, I think it was like a 400 point range and make some money. Um, there's minimal time value erosion because you're long one option, but you're short two. So the two options that are eroding are making up for the erosion on your long option. And you can get pretty close to the money. Remember we talked about that S&P option. If you wanted to buy it outright, it was like 3600 bucks. But with the spread, it's free. So you're using the market's money to pay for that speculative position. The disadvantage is if you're too right, you can, you can lose money if you're too right. If volatility increases after you're in the trade, sometimes you can feel trapped. So let's say that you, you purchase the 2,500 put we talked about, and you sold two 2,300 puts, and the market drops sharply. You're going to think that that's fantastic because you have a bearish trade on. But what might end up happening is if the volatility explodes, the losses on your short options will keep up with or maybe even outpace the gains on your long options. So even though you're right and everything's falling into your profit target and all these things are going your way, you might actually not be making money, and you might even see a, a a loss on it at some point if the volatility is big enough. So you might feel trapped and you might have to hold to expiration before you see any profits. And that's a challenge because what if the market, the S&P drops 300 points, it's perfectly in your range, you're near your max profit zone, you're, you're all excited, but you still have two months to expiration. And then suddenly the market rallies back and is no longer in your profit zone. So that can happen too. You can see with ratio spreads, sometimes the market will fall into the profit zone and then rally back out. And as a ratio spread trader, you may not have ever really seen much of a profit at all. So it can be frustrating in those ways. It can be used as a portfolio hedge, um, or maybe even a hedge of some other trades you have elsewhere in your stock account or whatever the case is. But a risk reversal is basically selling a call option and buying a put or vice versa. So in other words, you're, you're buying a call or a put, which is your primary money maker, and then you're selling the opposite to pay for it. This can be used as just an outright trade. So for example, if you think corn is going higher, you could purchase a call option and then you could sell a put option to pay for it. And again, it's a free trade. You make money if the market goes up. If the market trades sideways or slightly lower, you don't lose anything. So it can be done in, the, in that manner. But we're going to talk about it in, uh, relative to the S&P, and it can actually be used as a portfolio insurance or a type of. You can uh, 
calculate the margin on any particular spread before you put it on. And also, you can import very easily with a click of a button. You import your portfolio, so your current holdings, into the margin calculator, and you can um, check which positions that you currently have open that you want to be um, mar like calculated or uncheck them, you can check them, uncheck them, you can add positions, subtract positions, all that kind of stuff, so you can see what your margin will be per trade or on a portfolio basis at any time, and you can play around with it. So actually, it's really, really great. Like, um, when our clients get on margin call, of course, we're not, we don't love that they're on margin call, but the calculator is great, and that we can see what different adjustments would do to their margin and help them come up with a solution other than just getting out or adding money. So here's an example of what portfolio insurance might look like. Let's say that you think that there's a chance that we roll over and sell back off and you're not willing to take that risk in your portfolio and then over the next couple of months. One thing you could consider doing is selling a call above the market, in this case a 2700 call, and then purchasing a 2500 put. Uh, uh, this is, I can't remember when I put this example together, but it was a month or so ago. Maybe not quite that long, but anyways, you get the idea. Let, this might give you insurance for the next 30 days or so, and it's for free. The only, when I say for free, again, it's not costing you much of anything other than maybe some transaction costs and maybe a few bucks here and there depending on your option bills and, and those sorts of things. But it is costing you the upside on your portfolio. So if your stock portfolio is uh, invested in, an S&P type allocation and the market keeps going higher and you have this risk reversal trade on to hedge your portfolio, you're giving up gains above 2,700. So that's the downside, but there is no cash cost. It is free insurance. You're selling this option to pay for your insurance policy. If the market rolls back over, then your put is there to protect you. So let's see how this might look in a trading platform. So you can construct a risk reversal any way you want. You don't have to use at the money options. Really, honestly, it's, it's a synthetic long or a synthetic call. You might as well just buy or sell the futures contract. There's no reason to do an at the money risk reversal because you're basically just, you have the same risk and reward profile as a futures contract. So you're paying an extra commission and probably getting a little more slippage on the option for no reason at all. So I would say if you're going to do a risk reversal, use out of the money options. And of course, uh, you can, on the order entry window, you just click on the drop down menu and find risk reversal. It's all the way at the bottom. So will your hypothetical bid ask? And then from there, you can choose if you want to buy it or sell it. In this case, we are selling the risk reversal because we're selling. 2700 call and we're buying the opposite of this the 2500 we choose our price we choose the limit order and then we hit transmit once we hit transmit the order confirmation ticket comes up and we can verify that it is exactly what we're looking to do we're looking to sell the 2700 call we're buying the 2500 put the net cost or the net price is negative one dollar which is worth 50 bucks to a trader each dollar in the S&P is worth fifty dollars so we actually are collecting fifty dollars so not only is this insurance free but they're paying us to put it on and then we would hit submit the advantages of risk reversals are sideways it's no harm, no foul. You don't really make or lose anything, which is fine, right? It's better than um, most of the alternatives. If you buy a put and the market goes nowhere, you le lose your premium. If you sell a future and the market goes nowhere, you're going to lose at least something. So at the risk reversal, you really don't lose much of anything unless you're really wrong, unless the market goes above your short option strike price. The great thing is also it has unlimited profit potential. Now, in this example, we were using it as portfolio insurance. So we really don't have unlimited risk on the upside because our portfolio would be making money in, in a cash account. 
So that's a little bit tricky. And also, uh, we don't really have unlimited profit potential because that put is acting as insurance to protect our portfolio. But if you were doing this as a speculative nature, not to hedge some other asset you have in a different account, then it would come with unlimited risk on the upside and unlimited profit potential on the downside. But again, your risk is nothing if the market just trades sideways. Also, the, unlike the ratio spread, there's no need to hold a risk reversal to expiration. You can get in and out with quick profits if you're accurate. So it's not something you're going to be tied into for weeks like you might with a ratio spread. The disadvantage of a risk reversal is they're highly directional. You do have to be right in the overall direction to make money. You may not necessarily have to be right to not lose money, but to make money, you do have to be right. And the margin can be high if the strike prices are close together or in particular markets. And the S&P, the margin is probably going to be pretty hefty. You're probably looking at anywhere from three to 5,000, depending on where your strike prices are. So in the S&P, the margin might be high. If you're trading this type of strategy in the grains or something else, uh, the margin would actually be very, very low. And there's, this is a spread that is not hedged. Like remember how we, earlier in the class we talked about spreads are basically option positions that are inherently hedged because as the market's moving one way, part of the trade's making money and part's losing. This is the opposite. With a risk reversal, there's no hedge at all. Both positions are correlated. They're both pointing the right direction. Or I'm sorry, the same direction. So if you sell a call and you buy a put, both of those positions prefer to see the market go lower for you to make money. If the market doesn't go lower, it trades sideways, you don't lose, but you're not going to make money unless the market goes down. If the market goes up against you, both positions will lose. wrong, you're not only going to be uh, long the future, well, depending on which way you have it positioned, but if you're wrong, you're going to be losing on the short options and the, sh and the futures contract. And so to me, that would be a little too risky. I probably wouldn't do something like that. I would do a covered call using an at the money option or a covered put if you're doing the downside. So let's just assume we're, we're looking for the market to go higher. So I would be, prefer buying a future and then selling a near the money call option and then purchasing a cheap put. So I would sell an at the money option before I would try to bring in more premium by selling a put because you're putting yourself in a situation where if you're right, you're gonna make a ton of money. But if you're wrong, the risk is gonna be really high. Remember, the spread is listed in the buyer's perspective. So the spread's always going to be listed in the exchange format of the buyer's perspective down here. And then we get the bid ask once everything's entered correctly. And then we choose to either buy it or sell it. If we were buying the spread, we would be buying the 2700 and selling the 25. But we're selling the spread. We're doing the opposite of what the buyer's doing. We're selling the spread. So that means we're selling the 2700 and buying the 25. If I were going to trade a risk reversal, I would probably do it as a spread, correct? Yes, um, to the spread by just simply entering an order to sell the call and then another order to buy the put, and it's the same thing. I'd probably, depending on the market, I would probably enter it as a spread, though. Somebody else is asking if there's a possibility of using algo trading using the Zener 360, and yes, the Zener 360 uh, can be programmed if you're if you're knowledgeable enough to know how to, to program uh, algorithmic trading, this platform will allow you to auto trade systems. So a few things to keep in mind as you're entering trades on this platform, and I already mentioned this before, but I wanna make sure you understand. Um, the transmit button triggers an order confirmation window. So if you hit transmit, it's not gonna automatically be submitted. You're gonna get co a confirmation ticket and you're gonna get to go over the details. Don't hit new order unless you want to clear the order ticket. If you hit new order, your, this one here, 
you're basically wiping everything out and starting over. If the transmit button is grayed, that means you have something incorrect. In this particular case, the trader has not entered in the second symbol. So because the second symbol is not entered, the platform will not allow you to transmit it. Once you get everything correctly entered, the transmit button will go live and you'll be able to press it. If the options that you're entering into the platform don't match the exchange rules, the platform, there's no quotes here, that's because the platform's telling you something's wrong. You may even see that the symbol populates in red. If you see red, that means something's wrong. A lot of times it's simply a space. Make sure you have a space between the year and the type, which would be a C or a P. And again, if you don't know the symbols, you can always look them up by clicking on the magnifying glass right here. Now, because the markets are closed, I was, I'm unable to show you a few things in real time, so I made a short video. Hopefully, you can see this using um, the option, the quote board, which is over here on the right. I've got the option chain, and then here's just the quote board that's built into the platform. And as I have mentioned a few times throughout this presentation, you can click on the symbol to populate it into the order entry platform. You don't have to know the symbol, you don't have to search for it. If you can get it off of the quote board or the option chain, it'll populate for you. So let's go ahead and watch the video and hopefully I can hopefully you can see this clearly. Whoops, I'm going to restart it. Okay, sorry. Here we go. So the first thing is to go and change it from standard to the type of spread we're trading. You'll notice it populates the exchange rules. To enter the symbols, we can simply go to the quote board, which we've already loaded, and it populates the symbol right into the order entry platform for us. If I click new order, it clears everything out. I can go to the option chain and click on the option that I want to trade, and it populates it into the order entry ticket. And from there, you can see, because the symbols are correctly entered, I see a bid ask. I can change it to limit. I can change my price and then hit transmit. When I hit transmit, an order entry ticket will allow me to confirm the details and then I hit submit to submit it to the exchange. If I wanted to sell the spread, it's the exact same thing, but I would choose sell and submit. hours so people can see exactly how to enter these types of spreads. Um, but I think this should hopefully be a good starting point for everybody. And of course, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those. I uh, just wanted to point out, remember, if the order confirmation ticket is going to show the spread exactly how you want to trade it. So if you're confused about the buy and sell situation, Get it to the way you think you want it, hit transmit, and then you can verify on the order confirmation ticket whether it is, in fact, what you're doing. You always know if you're buying or selling the spread by the credit. You'll see down here at the bottom, it'll say credit or debit. If it says debit, that means you're paying. If it says credit, that means you're receiving that money. So this is the same trade as uh, the previous slide, but you'll notice it's a debit this time because we're buying. So if we're buying it, it's going to be a debit where this is a strangle. So we're buying both sides. Okay, so there's some things to know about spread trading. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. So there's that are important. Most people are looking for convenience, but they don't realize that they're giving up a whole lot of efficiency. So it's not always necessary to place orders as spreads. The advantage of doing so is you don't risk getting filled on one leg and not getting filled on the other. When this happens, sometimes the other leg of the trade can get away from you. So for example, if you're buying an option strangle and you buy the call and you have an order working to buy the put, but suddenly the market makes a big move higher, or I'm sorry, lower, your 
your put is going to be more expensive. So now suddenly, instead of the price that you thought you were going to get filled on the put, you're paying a lot more, and that might even ruin your trade. So that does happen if you're legging in and out of the of the option spreads, but that would be rare. Um, you want to make sure you're not trying to leg in and out of spreads during economic announcements or during the uh, inventory report for crude oil or something like that. You know, be mindful of those sorts of things. So. From that point of view, trading spreads on a single ticket is less stressful. But the disadvantage is you might actually be facing wider bid ask spreads on the sp spread ticket than you would if you just bought or sold the options individually. And the reason being it's a little more difficult for market makers to price their risk and, uh, and handle their risk on spreads, especially if you're talking about multi-leg crazy spreads. Like I know traders that trade ratio spreads and calls and puts and they try to, they want to put it all on one single ticket with like six legs and that's fine and I, I understand the strategy but the reality is just because you can build it doesn't mean a market maker is going to want to execute it that way and he might do it but he's probably going to execute it at poor prices so you might actually be better off breaking things apart and trading like if you're if you're trading a call ratio and a put ratio at the same time maybe do the call and on one ticket and the put on the other ticket, not try to do it in one big giant ticket, which this platform would not allow you to do at this time. In the future it will, but some platforms do. Uh, in all honesty, I'm not sure it's in your best interest to do that anyway. So we already mentioned that the spread price that's displayed is hypothetical. There's no guarantee that you're going to get filled at the bid or the ask that's shown. Not all spread types are listed. There's other spreads. There's iron condors. There's Christmas trees. There's all sorts of stuff. But the reality is most of those other spreads you can create by combining one or two of the spreads that are in the Zener 360. So if you really wanted to bunch at least some of it together, again, when you start doing really wild multi-leg spreads, it's not always in your best interest to try to spread trade it because you can probably get better fills just by legging in. If you do decide to leg in, my advice is enter all buy orders on the bid and all sell orders on the ask. That way they're not going to get filled right away and it gives you time to get the other orders in. Then once all of those orders are in and probably not filled, you can toggle the prices to get the prices somewhere in the middle of the bid and the ask. Um, and so it doesn't matter if you are entering orders as a spread or it treats it exactly the same as it would if you sold it all on one ticket as a strangle. So don't be afraid to miss out on some sort of margin benefit because that's just not how it works. You're always going to be given portfolio margin at the end of the day. Assuming that your brokerage uses portfolio margin, I should point that out, not all brokerages will allow you to sell options, not all of them will allow you to trade option spreads. and most of, I don't want to say most, but not all of them will give you exchange minimum span portfolio margining. We do all of these things. We specialize in option trading and option selling. So we're a little bit of a, a unicorn, but make sure if you do start to do these types of trades, make sure your broker is willing um, to accommodate you because not all of them are. Okay, I apologize that this was such a long class. I think, as I mentioned before, um, we tried to fit a lot of information here, and honestly, we didn't get half of what we wanted to get into this class. We'll probably have to do another one next month. Hopefully, you'll join us. If you have any questions or if there's anything we could do for you, you can visit our website. You can send us an email or a text message. Uh, our, our office number actually accepts text messages, so feel free to send us a text message. If you're interested in learning more about trading options and option spreads and that sort of thing, my books are available on Amazon. And if you're a Kindle user, they're actually pretty cheap on Kindle, so check them out. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please look me up. Um, okay, so I'm going to see if I can answer a couple of these questions. Uh, do we offer NinjaTrader? We do not. NinjaTrader is its own brokerage service. They do their own thing. We are not, we cannot we cannot offer their platform at this time because of uh, their situation. 
NinjaTrader also does not offer options, so you'd never be able to trade options on a NinjaTrader platform. Yes, you can trade futures on the Zaner 360. The Zaner 360 allows you to trade futures and options both side by side in the same platform, so it's really awesome. Most of the strategies that we tend to recommend and teach our clients involve trading futures against options. So a lot of times if we put out a recommendation, it might be something to, along the lines of going along a futures contract and then selling a call option against it and then buying a put. So a lot of times um, we're basically trading both instruments all at the same time. So Bob's asking what, what are the best in instruments to use option spreads. I mean, it's really hit or miss, but you want to stick with liquidity. So S&P, Treasuries, uh, Euro, the grains are all pretty good, so you have to kind of be careful with that. But the, the best indicator is check the bid ask. If the bid ask is reasonable, then it's probably worth trading. Uh, someone's asking for covered calls and puts, which instruments are ideal for using smaller margin? Um, I mean, again, it doesn't work in all markets, and it doesn't work in all markets at all times, because you want to make sure you're collecting enough premium to make it worth your while, and you want to be able to purchase your insurance for a reasonable cost, so it's a little bit tricky. There's no black or white, but we like doing covered calls in the grains, um, not corn. Corn's a little cheap right now when it comes to options, but soy meal, soybeans, wheat, those sorts of things. Uh, the treasuries it can work pretty well in. If you have not already, I encourage you to sign up for a free trial of our newsletter, the DeCarly Perspective. You can do it on our website. We'll show you a lot of our trades in real time, the good, bad, and the ugly. And someone's asking again about NinjaTrader. Is it for options? No, NinjaTrader does not offer options at all. Uh, right you have 10. It just depends on what's going on. Uh, someone's asking about a Christmas tree spread. A Christmas tree spread is basically a vertical spread that you sell an extra option on. So if, if you did a vertical call spread, you'd be buying a call, selling a call, and then selling another call above that. So it's just a way to basically turn your uh, vertical spread into a free trade. Okay, I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. We w did record this, so we'll hopefully we'll be able to post the video within the next day or two. Thank you.